to the finest crew in Starfleet. Engage. Watch your back, Jean-Luc. Jean-Luc. I'm Captain Captain Janeway of the USS Voyager. Captain Captain Janeway of the USS Voyager. Captain Welcome to The Greatest Generation. It's a Star Trek podcast by a couple of guys who are a little bit embarrassed to have a Star Trek podcast. I'm Ben Harrison. I'm Adam Pranica. Really dragon ass today. You were drinking the same stuff I was drinking last night, and it uh, really smacked you, huh? I think it might have been maybe overindulging in some food, <laughs> specifically. Food maybe even more than drink. Yeah. We went out for KBBQ with a bud last night. Yeah. I was definitely like up in the middle of the night needing water desperately. I found that as I age, I'm much more sensitive to salt, like yeah. salty food, as a thing that makes me feel bad. Yeah, samesies. And yeah, we we really took a tour of the KBBQ menu and- <laughs> We did. It did not seem like I could hydrate fast enough before bed. No. They kept the water coming at that restaurant, but uh, yeah. still, it crushes me when I'm up in the middle of the night to pee, and then also a different time to drink tons and tons of water. Yeah. It really bothers me that the human birdie works like that. <laughs> you really get a sense for the use case for the hotel room IV treatment, you know? Sure, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why we haven't availed ourselves of that. In the vast. I know. I should just be hanging bag at home, <laughs> right by the bed. Wouldn't that make it easier? That's what we need. We need to get like nurse certifications for ourselves and hang hang a little bit of bag. For so many things, Broad is tantamount to hanging bag. Yeah. But uh, not even Broad could see me through this particular amount of sodium. <laughs> it was a lot. It was a lot. Yeah. I got quite a bit of enjoyment last night about uh, an anecdote that you related. Mm -hmm. This is kind of a, a segment that we've been, I think we tried this out on Greatest Trek maybe, but uh, I, I feel like it could it could work on Greatest Gen. Oh, how, how do you mean? The rare, the very unusual, good bit moment. Bits, bits, bits. No matter what, you're always doing bits, bits, bits. No matter what, you're always doing bits, bits, bits. An amazing bit. Good bit moment. Big laughs all around. I think this could be only the second time in our show's history this has ever happened. <laughs> but yeah, I told the story at the dinner table last night with you of this great bit moment I had. And it killed at the table, just like it killed in the moment. The good bit goes like this. It was uh, it was Father's Day, and I was taking the drive to see my parents, and I stopped at a dispensary on the way, not for myself, though it really comes in handy sometimes. <laughs> I was shopping for my dad, my dad being a weed dad. <laughs> and I go in there, and you know how there's, you're always greeted by a bud tender who wants to help you. Yeah. I always like these interactions. Yeah, it's a very funny, like, because, like, the average marijuana dispensary in Southern California that is recreational oriented at this point is either, like, still super head shoppy or is trying to look like an Apple store. But even when it looks like an Apple store, the guy that works there or the lady that works there is super duper head shoppy. <laughs> <laughs> I think that description was spot on here. This was an Apple store looking store with a friend of mine from college. He used to wear stuffed animals pinned to his Jinko jeans. Like <laughs> that type of silhouette is happening yeah. here. Okay. <laughs> Great person. Totally empty store. I got the sense that Father's Day wasn't a, a big marijuana shopping holiday. Hmm. That's shocking. So with this in mind, I roll in and I, I'm i greeted by my bud tender and he asks what I'm looking for and how strong would I like it? And I said, uh, I would like something for my dad who is kind of an enthusiast for these things. <laughs> so I'll need something that is too strong for a touring funk band. 
<laughs> All I do is bits, bits, bits. No matter what. And this guy explodes with laughter. <laughs> and also the four other bud tenders who were just standing there <laughs> waiting for the next customer. <laughs> it totally killed. It was great. You know, like I've been guilty of being the guy in the restaurant who has an empty plate and the surfer comes around and said, I hated it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or the, can you pack the rest of this up so I can take it home in a doggy bag? Like, right, right. I am embarrassed to say I have whipped that bit out on innocent servers that didn't need that mess. I hate hearing that, Ben. Yeah. They don't deserve that. It sucks. It's hard enough. I, f I feel terrible about it. But the premise of those is that uh, this is a fun joke that we can share between, mm -hmm. the, you know, like the problem with it is that it's, it is so, you know, threadbare as a joke that everybody is sick and tired of it. And I think that the thing that's really delightful about your good bit moment is that that feels like it is like the first time anybody ever said, hey, can you put the rest of this in a doggy bag so I can take it home at a restaurant? You yeah. know? Yeah, it felt momentous. That bit has like a good six months. I uh -huh. hope the Friends of DeSoto will help themselves to it, go out into the world, buy a marijuana, say this thing. Just as your uh, question for a pediatrician has <laughs> taken hold in the <laughs> FOD community, and, <laughs> and those parents of young babies have done that bit at their doctor's. I, I'm just saying, like, like after six months, it's over. You know, we can never return to, okay. to the good bit. Yeah. You know? Yeah. We should be able to think up new bits by then. <laughs> <laughs> one in the, uh, in the plus column for you, one in the plus column for me, probably all that we will ever have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it feels good once in a while to have a good bit moment. It really does. I'm so glad you shared that with yeah. the friends of DeSoto. <laughs> yeah, it felt good. Felt good, man. You know what else feels good is talking about some Star Trek, my friend. Do you want to get into season six, episode 12 of Star Trek Voyager? I sure do, Ben. It's called Blink of an Eye. Reverse course. Unless you've got something a little bigger in your torpedo tubes. I'm not turning around. <laughs> we are pulling up on a swollen bagel in space. Oh, it really is, isn't it? I got bored one day. I'm gonna put everything on a bagel. Is the shape of this planet toroidal? Like, are, are there like holes in the in the pools? It seemed like that kind of seat you see at a design within reach that's like always on sale because no one ever buys one. But even at like <laughs> two thousand dollars, just mm -hmm. seems like too much seat. Like, <laughs> no one has that seat. Yeah. No, no one has the polar region for a seat like that. No. Yeah, this thing is half quasar, half dwarf star, and all banger. Yeah. It's uh, turning at 58 RPMs. Pretty <laughs> nice. Yeah. And Voyager is very curious about it, so they pull up to it to, uh, to get a load. And yeah, the effects of this planet knock their warp drive out almost immediately. Classic blunder. Yeah, classic getting too close, isn't it? They seem to do a lot of that on this show. Yeah. <laughs> like, a, we're curious about this thing. Oops. <laughs> Once they get pulled in, we cut to the surface of this planet where we see a yurt-based civilization. And yeah. oh, no. Are those pan flutes I'm hearing? Mm-mm. Oh, no. And this villager's, like, doing some sort of farmer's market shopping. <laughs> And he gets distracted by this light in the sky, and uh, those bangers are going to bruise his fruit. Oh, man. Yeah, it's a, it's a good thing the grass is so supple on this planet. The composite, like, looking down the hill at the village, very weird. <laughs> very weird layering of, like, matte paintings and, like, green screen footage of people in costumes walking around. It's rarely looked more distracting than this, right? Yeah, and, like, I feel like it gets better throughout the episode because they return to this composition over mm -hmm. time to, you know, illustrate the advancement of this society. But uh, this yeah. first one, woof. <laughs> yeah. After the theme, these villagers are thinking that they saw God up there. Yeah. And what happened when you put the fire fruit on the altar, man? What did you do? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. 
<laughs> Throw the fire fruit away. Yeah. The gods don't want your fire fruit, Derek. <laughs> the village leader's interpretation of things is that they need to make another altar just for fire fruit, just for this thing in the sky. No one gets to eat fire fruit anymore. Fire fruit is not on the menu, boys. Yeah. No one seems to make a big deal. Like if this were to happen now mm -hmm. and all of a sudden someone said, no more plums, actually all stone fruit. <laughs> Those are for the altar. That would be awful. Yeah. I would hate that. But no one makes a big deal out of the fire fruit thing, right? Maybe they're all like, hey man, like I kind of thought fire fruit was giving me some gastrointestinal <laughs> stuff anyways. So like no harm, no fail, really. Yeah. People are willing to part with a fire fruit. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if it means appeasing whatever this is up in the sky. I was immediately thinking about all the other villages that presumably also exist on this planet and what coincidental thing did they do that seemed to trigger the yeah. arrival of the bringer of the shakes and the bringer of the light. Derek stopped jacking it after this <laughs> night. <laughs> what did you do? I was just jacking it. <laughs> You know, at the end of uh, Fifth Element, when the guy like is like, "We're all gonna fucking die," and then the stone opens. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, like they they all must have interpreted it as something like this. Yeah. Anyways, I guess these are like the only guys on the planet that are thinking in this way. In my village, Derek fucked the fire fruit at the time this thing appeared, and now he must constantly fuck the fire fruit. <laughs> <laughs> the constant fucker. <laughs> so uh, back up on Voyager it's announced that they are stuck in synchronous orbit over the equator and everybody's like attaboy Tom and he's like don't give me back my second pip too fast I yeah. didn't really have a lot to do with that Yeah, that just happened but they're stuck like they're stuck in the mud they don't have warp drive they don't have any way of breaking out of orbit and they discover that the super fast spin of this planet and the like tachyon core situation means that one second on Voyager translates to about a day down on the planet. Pretty wild to think about. Also wild to think about how rare it is that Seven ever leaves the ass lab. That just seems to be where she works yeah. and where she stays now. Yeah. Very, very occasional trip to the lunchroom, but she really doesn't like it in there. Seven says that the ship has disrupted the poles of the planet and uh, unexpected changes to the polar region have occurred. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Voyager seems to have become the planet's third pole. That's not good. I mean, it's a lot like if you, you know, haven't had fire fruit in a long time and then you eat a bunch of fire fruit, it can cause similar disruptions to your polar region. Yeah. It's a lot more dietary fiber than you might be used to. It's true. You can't just live on a diet of Haribo gummies <laughs> to make that work. Oh, yeah. No one can live on Haribo gummies alone. Yeah. <laughs> Not even touring funk bands. So here's the danger. The closer they get to this thing, the faster the crew will age. Yeah. So they better stay at this altitude. Yeah. They, uh, they don't want to get any closer Chicote and BLT are trying to work on getting the warp drive back, and they think that the gravitational situation down on the planet might have something to tell them about how. So they're getting a probe ready, and Chicote's like, hey, like, while you're thinking about that, let's make some modifications to the probe to study the surface of this planet because this is like an amazing chance to study like a you know, if there's an intelligent species down there, we could like take photos of their entire history unfolding. And BLT is like, hey, Chicote, why the peeping <laughs> over the course of a millennia? <laughs> and Chicote weirdly thinks that this will help his career somehow. I mean, his first love was anthropology. It's why he got into Starfleet. That's true. It's why he got into space piracy also. <laughs> I love how BLT just kind of humors him. Yeah. This is nice. Yeah. Whatever, Chicote. She's like, it's going to take a couple hours. And he's like, uh, oh, wow, we might miss the, the first civilization. We'll have to catch the second one. Yeah. yeah. Which uh, I really like. Uh, that's a good bit. Back on the planet, it's more pan flutes. 
in the score. <laughs> Sounds great. And we've got a real Colonel Sanders type hustling up some stone steps where he's greeted by a protector. And the protector has got a project going on. He wants to send a letter to what he's calling the ground shaker or light bringer that's in the sky above them. And Colonel Sanders thinks this guy is an idiot. He kind of has like, uh, you know, Aristotle talking to Alexander the Great kind of vibes. He definitely has that Halloween party store costume of like (laughs) ancient genius, which is basically like a maroon robe with a uh, a rope belt. (laughs) Ancient genius because they don't want to like get sued by the Aristotle estate. Yeah. It's true. <laughs> Cause he's like he's telling the protector, like, I did, I taught you better than that. And the, the protector's like, You superstitious old fuck. I'm sending a letter to these people, but I don't know how to read or write. You didn't teach me that part. The protector's got such a weird position because the Colonel Sanders character is like, You are an idiot for just like making your default reaction to something you don't understand, like worship. <laughs> and he's like, no, man, I'm not. I'm here. I'm going to send a letter yeah. and also worship. And it, the, the letter like winds up sounding pretty legalistic. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit more like suing the government than sending, you know, a prayer in a luminaria. Uh, per the appearance in uh, the night sky. <laughs> It would behoove you to (laughs) cease and desist from bringing of shakes and bringing of uh, the light. Uh, The bruising of the fire fruits cannot stand. (laughs) Our people lack in a sufficient source of non-soluble fiber in their (laughs) diet, and therefore... We would like you to return the fire fruit to our purview. This is the only time we meet the protector, really, and he is an interesting guy because, like, not only does he want to worship this thing and send it a letter, he also has an interesting hypothesis about, like, the night sky being full of planets and planets with civilizations that may or may not be like theirs. And, yeah, I mean, this guy's kind of half idiot, I guess. It's a really good guess is what it is. Like, yeah. it, like based on zero information, he has decided that every point of light in the sky is probably a city with someone much like him in charge of it. Prove me wrong. <laughs> hey, you don't get to ascend to the top of the mountain and become protector without getting a little lucky with your predictions. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Of course, it's locked in. What? Listen to me very carefully because I'm only going to say this once. Do it. How the fuck does this balloon work, though? Because they're like, it looks like it's a, like a hot air balloon when it's on the ground. But then when they let it go, the fire part is not attached and doesn't go with it. <laughs> it's great. Like, how many hot air balloons do you know of that are made of leather? <laughs> <laughs> with, like, fur still on it? This thing is like an old-timey canteen. <laughs> And then, like, uh, it falls down, like, 300 miles away, Mm -hmm. and some rural farmers find the note and are like, bringer of shakes and light. What the fuck is this? It lands on Jake's jackin' cabin, where he's just (laughs) given a constant supply of fire fruit to fuck. (laughs) (laughs) They've answered! (laughs) They've answered my jack-offs! Finally! (laughs) Finally, I can stop! And lay my weapon down. We cut to orbit where the probe has now been deployed. And it's giving back information about the industrial development of this planet. And they're noticing that there's tons of iron in the construction that these people use. And it's because this planet has been racked by earthquakes since Voyager has been in orbit. So they figured out like really high resilience, seismic construction techniques much earlier in their development as a intelligent species than is normal, apparently. We get a fun reminder of how time works in this area because the probe starts to fail when it's sending back all of this information, and that's because it's aging so quickly. Probes weren't meant to probe for 200 years, right? 
Right. Yeah, unless you get it made out of like a really inert material like glass, you do want to replace your probes from time to time. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't accidentally leave them in a rental property. <laughs> <laughs> so they make it self-destruct and I thought for a moment this wasn't going to work. I thought it was going to follow the surface and then it's yeah. going to give them something else to worship. That doesn't end up happening. Instead, uh, we cut down and like astronomers in a sort of, you know, old timey looking out of giant telescopes context are trying to send a signal to Voyager and it's prime numbers in the elemental constants and they're sending these signals and not getting anything back. Like the assistant to the lead scientist is like, I don't know, man, like maybe we should send something more interesting, like a gold record with uh, pictures of our birdies <laughs> etched yeah. into it. Like, maybe that would help. Maybe we should uh, use the first contact technique used for time of Miriam of sending nudes. <laughs> <laughs> like, the crude depiction of, like, Jake fucking a fire fruit. <laughs> <laughs> See, we're cool. <laughs> like that instead of the crucifix has been hung in all of the uh, religious buildings yeah. for hundreds of years on this We're planet. into the same thing as you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're talking a little bit about like the place that the sky ship, which is what they now call it, has played in each of their respective childhoods. And the older scientists grew up in a like, the sky ship is an evil palace where bad guys live and their their protector is bad and our protector is good. The younger guy, you know, grew up with sky ship friends cartoons on TV and he had all the toys. It's pretty great. Yeah. You know, now that they have smartphones, he likes playing sky ship friends go mm. while he walks around town. Yeah. So the, you know, the prime numbers and the elemental constants don't work. And they're like, what if we uh, rig up a microphone and try like, broadcasting at the ship and up on Voyager in the ass lab, they realize that they're receiving an amplitude modulation radio signal. AM radio, Adam. That's right. The locals are broadcasting right wing talk opinion at the Voyager. <laughs> I don't think we have anything in common with the people of this planet. <laughs> and Chakotay is like, really? I mean, I heard there's a guy who likes to fuck fruit down there. <laughs> Maybe we should forward this stuff on to uh, the Midas Array and see if Dwight Schultz can tell us a thing or two about this oh, situation. Yeah. He knows everything about that. A rare episode of the McLaughlin Group. Issue one. Where they listen to some, some radio broadcasts from the AM band and talk about what it means. This guy, once you hear the message, made me think of what a great speaker he was. I thought with how time was moving... We'd eventually realize that this guy would be their president or something. Like, he's a really good representative for his people and what they're after. Yeah. And he ends his message with an invitation to visit. It really made me sad thinking about how hard life must be for these people. Like, they're like, please just stop with the fucking earthquakes. Like, we are so tired of it. <laughs> like, after hundreds of years, you know? Here's what I want to ask you, though, is. By only seeing bangers and not seeing their results, do you think that hurts the strength of their argument? Because, like, all we ever see is shit kind of shaking around. But, like, an exterior shot of a city in ruins, I think, would be way more compelling if the message really is stop the shaking. Yeah. Which it seems to be over and over again. It just doesn't hit the way I think the show thinks it does. Let's put a pin in that because I I have some thoughts about that, but okay. uh, in relation to scenes that we haven't gotten to yet. Yeah. Floated is the idea of a meeting and Tuvok is like, nope, prime directive. <laughs> they are not a warp-capable civilization. And also, whoever that guy is, he's been dead for hundreds of years. That guy's dead anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but Chakotay's like, it's not a prime directive breach because like our ship is already part of the culture. Like yeah. we've been here for hundreds and hundreds of years. Like the breach done happened already. And Paris is like, yeah, that sounds like first contact to me. First contact, whether we like it or not, is basically what has happened. And 
they're talking about like these guys could have information that we need to leave orbit because what they are after is this like gravimetric pattern, which for some reason they can't figure out from the ship. Right. So maybe talking to one of them will give them the intelligence they need to get the hell out of there. The idea comes up in this meeting, like we could send the doctor down because like it would like the physiology of like going to fast motion for one of us wouldn't work. It's uh, like listening to a podcast at 60 X. Like you're, you're not even going to absorb the information, much less the cadence of the jokes. Very, very few people could absorb a podcast that way, (laughs) but some do (laughs) for whatever reason. So the doctor is going to go down because he can, he can take it because he's not the hero we deserve, but he's the one we need right now. That's right. Janeway's like, under no circumstances are you to engage the people. You must only take pictures. <laughs> photographs? Just photographs. She's really bragging about like what high-tech equipment they have here uh, on yeah. the ship. <laughs> Doctor seems uniquely unimpressed with this. Yeah. I've always believed that the mind is the best weapon. We cut over to the bridge where... Chakotay has become a real student of this civilization. He's got all the uh, state capitals memorized. (laughs) He can spell the weirdly named state Mm -hmm. from memory. He can sing songs about it. Kim's really impressed by this. And what they're doing on the bridge is trying to decide where exactly to send the doctor. You don't just want to like drop him into an alley like most Star Trek episodes would. I also like that they like don't even know what the people look like yet, so they have yeah. to give hit the doctor the ability to adjust his own physical appearance like on the fly. I like that a lot. What if they're big purple blobs of protoplasm? Then you'll be the best looking blob on the planet. Janeway tells him he has two seconds in Voyager time, and that'll be two days of on the surface time. Yeah. Uh, he's not... Not supposed to talk to anybody. He's just supposed to see if he can get some information. Maybe, uh, maybe steal an almanac and get back mm-hmm. up to Voyager. And the transporter does not work when they try and throw it in reverse. What a scene! They really try to get him, and they can't. I thought that the first thought Chakotay has of like, look for opera houses. <laughs> That's where he's going to be for sure. It was very funny. That was a very straight out of Frasier type moment right there. (laughs) (laughs) That was big fun. Yeah. Like, where would he be? Where could he be if he's down there for years? Like, you don't get the sense that the doctor is going to become the King Zack of the situation, like from Strange New Worlds. Like, he's definitely going to instead choose artistic popularity over any sort of political power. Right. Pretty quickly, they do get him back, but... At this point, enough seconds have passed that he was down there for three years. Yeah. He had a girlfriend. Wow. He lived in an apartment. Uh His apartment was bombed in a war. So much stuff happened to him. He seems to be relishing this post-mission update, you know? I thought it was very interesting that the episode spends no time on the captain going, like, I hope you stayed out of sight and didn't, like, (laughs) violate my one order, which was not to talk to anyone. Yeah. Does not work out that way. No. Three years is a long time, Captain. You'll get no argument from me. I've got to get that platinum. Get that roll metal argument. I've got to get that platinum. Would not. Are you planning a heist? Gold. I'm giving you an order. I'm giving you an order. Is that understood? I'm giving you an order. I'm giving you, and you have just crossed the line. What do you understand are the doctor's abilities, W slash R slash T, like accumulating data, like the way the character data would? Like, yeah. could he just absorb that the way data can? I feel like he must be able to. Like, I kind of wish they'd written him as being his own tricorder a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, what does he need all that stuff for? The business of having the tricorder is good for for acting in in scenes, I guess. But like, it'd be kind of cool if he didn't even need it, you know? Yeah. One interesting thing the doctor says is that Voyager is sort of central in everything the people are doing, whether or not it's with their technology or with their art or whatever. Like, Voyager represents a thing to aspire toward. 
in all ways. Yeah. And the society is making improvements to all those areas as a result. It's sort of like uh, when you're like, you know, worried that people are going to think what you do for a living is embarrassing or whatever. And then your wife says, like, I'm sure nobody is thinking about you that much. Yeah. And then you find out actually everyone is thinking about you all the time and how embarrassing your job is. It's hard to know what cuts deeper. <laughs> the knowledge that that may or may not be true or a special life partner telling you that uh, no one cares. <laughs> Even me. There's a space race going between all the different states on this planet to see who can get to Voyager first. And he's saying, like, somebody's coming soon. And the captain asks the ominous question, is that going to be an astronaut or a warhead? And yeah. it sounds like it sort of depends on which state wins the race. Will it be a warhead or a person head? <laughs> If it's a Leica, I don't think I can take that. That's too sad. <laughs> For some reason, Naomi Wildman gets a scene in this episode. She's working on her own report about this planet. She workshops the name of that report with Seven a little bit. I like how Seven is like the Justin Timberlake of the social network in this scene. <laughs> like really cleaning up that title. Yeah. Yeah, makes it a lot cooler. Drop the the, just Facebook. Perfect. Good job, Seven. You know, by the time I deleted Facebook and stopped going there, I was like going through the like quick bookmarks in my browser and I realized that it had been thefacebook.com in my bookmark list. You had it way back then. It had been there for that long, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, wild. So this is when they try and leave orbit. They've got up enough power to to make a go of it or whatever. And they try, and this causes a an earthquake on the surface that I thought the stakes could have been a lot higher for. Like, this is sort of like what you were talking about earlier, where we don't see a ruined city. And when they talk about it, they're like, oh, yeah, it was just like a coastal area. It's no big deal. Make it a big deal. Make these people have a understandable gripe and not just a like we don't like it when the ground shakes a little bit but we built all our buildings super strong so it doesn't matter that much if all of the bangers matter kind of none of the bangers matter you know yeah like make them distinct and this one should be like devastating yeah so they stop trying to leave that's the main takeaway right and we cut to some characters who have left the surface in a rocket We've got some person heads on board this thing. <laughs> yeah. And it's Daniel Day Kim as one of them. Amazing. Very young, very fresh-faced Daniel Day Kim. One of the greats. Kind of pre-super famous, right? Like, I don't, think, yeah. I don't think he'd done a lot at this point in his career. Yeah. Very fun to see him in this episode. He is the pilot, and he and his commander don't seem to know about the temporal shift, so, like, they lose contact with their people, and you can tell that it's just... The radio broadcast are super sped up. Yeah. And she's, you know, that type of commander that's like, whatever, we're out of contact, but we're going to do the mission anyways. And I kind of love that about her. Yeah. I guess we'll have to go inside. And they pull up to Voyager and connect and are like crawling through Jeffrey's tubes before we realize what's going on in a fun way. If you were to just like hit pause on the ship and all of its occupants, it doesn't seem like another alien race could just fly their shuttle up to the ship and somehow gain entry. Right. Right? <laughs> Good for them. Yeah. Did, did they cut a hole? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You really do skip a scene and get inside Voyager as these two are, are climbing down ladders. Yeah. I got to say, the crotch zippers of their spacesuits really draw the eye. There's some some cod inside those pieces, let me tell you. <laughs> kind of looks useful for their obvious purpose. Yeah, for fucking the sky people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why both of them just have a hand on the zipper ready to go. Right, yeah. They're, they're trained in fast draw. 
Yeah. So the the Voyager crew kind of appear frozen to them, but warm to the touch. Yeah. So they're like, are they in some kind of stasis or like, what's going on? Would it be right to fuck them? No, I guess. Yeah. Like they can't really say yes or no yeah. in this state. That would be bad. So they, they make it onto the bridge before the temporal shift really affects them. You can't tell me that the people involved with this scene aren't fans of Police Squad because the Janeway and Neelix coffee pouring freeze frame is just so perfect. <laughs> it really is. Uh, yeah, the, the coffee is flowing all over the floor. Uh huh. <laughs> Daniel Day Kim is like, it's amazing. It's like they don't even know we're here. <laughs> but then they like, you know, they both feel bad and fall over. And then we're in real time with the Voyager crew noticing that they have a couple of interlopers. And this time transition kills the mission commander. And it's just Daniel Day Kim that wakes up in Six Bay. Yeah. We tried to shoot her into space in a torpedo casing and it went really fast. <laughs> <laughs> faster than any torpedo we've ever shot. <laughs> he accepts the, like, your crew is dead, everyone you've ever met is dead thing really well. I love that his first reaction is about that. Like, in multiple scenes, that seems to be his starting point. That feels right. Yeah, but... They're very conscious of the fact that they need to get him back as quickly as possible because every second he spends up here, his culture is going through the grief of having lost their space mission and then, you know, moving on and becoming angry and vengeful. So they're like, hey, but, you know, we could really use your help with this, like, gravity data that the EMH brought back because uh, that stuff will help us potentially get out of here. What do you make of like the macro versus micro problem that Daniel Day Kim is grappling with here? Because by only painting the consequence of his actions as a like everyone on your planet is aging super quickly and dying at a rate that is almost impossible to comprehend versus I got a wife and a and a dog down there. Like he never makes it so personal to him. Yeah. And I think that was another missed opportunity here. Like I wanted to feel for his situation more, but even he seems to have like a super big picture yeah. relationship with what's going on with him. He's an astronaut in a space capsule. Give him a photo of his family to stick in the controls, you know? I mean, that would kill him almost instantly, <laughs> given what we know about the powers of those photographs. Yeah. I know you don't want to do it. Do it. Coffee black. Make it yourself. I'm trying to help you see this as an opportunity to grow. Make it yourself. I was very distracted after they established, like, okay, we like your culture will be more alien to you than us if we don't get you back really quickly. And then he's like wandering around the halls in no particular hurry, talking sports with the EMH. Yeah. Mountain or lakeside? Mountain, of course. Don't tell me you're a lakeside supporter. That seemed too idle of a, of a conversation to have at a moment where we're trying to establish that the clock is super ticking on him. This seems to be a quality of some Star Trek episodes, too, where it's like the central problem can be very, very serious and treated seriously, or it can be very, very serious with also a little bit of a uh, a beat <laughs> in there for humor yeah. or whatever. And that's definitely what the scene between the doctor and him is for. He's like a little bit melancholic about the idea of the skyship leaving because he feels like it's been a source of great inspiration for his people and... He's like, maybe we like won't feel motivated to do anything after you go. Yeah. Which is a real like, uh, you can't break up with me because I'll do self-harm kind of a yeah. controlling donut planet move. There's a scene where Daniel Day Kim and Janeway talk about the prospect of him leaving. And as if this episode is a musical Daniel Day Kim breaks into song rather than answering a question. Star of the night, star of the day, come to take my tears away. 
In other hands, this would be an awful moment in this episode. But like there's a sincerity to this performance that actually makes it work. This shouldn't work. Shouldn't work. But it does. Yeah. He's got a great singing voice. I don't think I've ever heard him sing before. The melody was very like, it doesn't end in a, on a note that is comforting to our like Western music sensibilities. Yeah. Which I thought was interesting. I'm not comfortable criticizing anyone else's ability to sing though either. I was saying he was a good singer. <laughs> no, I mean, even- I'm not allowed to say that? <laughs> Saying anything at all about anyone else's singing. I just don't know if, if we have license to do that. Okay. Michael Jordan was a basketball player. I will not say anything about Indeed. the quality of his play. Yeah, that's fair. Daniel Day Kim is an actor who <laughs> sings occasionally. All right. I get your point. <laughs> I won't ask you if you like this episode. All right. <laughs> So in the ass lab, he's working with Seven when they start detecting the sure signs that warp experimentation is being done on the surface of the planet. And the warp experimentation seems pretty disastrous. It's like implosions. Yeah. It, it seems bad. Yeah. But yeah, they're trying to figure this stuff out. And this is going to take all of these prime directive concerns right off the table. Yeah, as soon as you're warp capable, that means you're open for communications. Yeah, but it also means that they're capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Voyager, and pretty quickly, bangers start getting dropped on the ship. The bangers are coming in so fast that they can't even detect what's causing them, but it's, uh, it's torpedoes. I like how grounded this moment is in the reality of, of technology in Star Trek, right? Like... We've seen it over and over again that with warp technology comes greater weapons technology. And that's often like a fork in the invention road to societies. Daniel Day Kim sort of feels like this is, you know, a moment for him to try and do some diplomacy. So he's like apologizing for what his people are are trying to do. And Janeway's like, you know, we're in their orbit. They have every right. Yeah. The only thing we can do is send you back and have you beg them to stop shooting at us. What an interesting idea. Like, you don't get the sense that Daniel Day Kim wants to stay, but he's got to be a little disappointed to be leaving, right? Yeah. Like, I wish I could hang out for a little bit longer. I mean, everybody I know is dead anyways. Yeah. Yeah. And the problem with what's happening on the surface is that, like, the weapons technology is getting better every time they shoot something. So they kind of have to hurry to get Daniel Day Kim down there again to uh, plead their case. So they get him back in his spacesuit and the EMH is walking him to his ship. And it's like, man, like they're going to listen to you just based on the way your crotch looks in this suit. Like <laughs> who, who could turn down a man hanging this much knuck? Yeah, that is... Long zipper energy <laughs> happening down there. How, how does the EMH have a kid down on that planet? What technology did he invent? It's a long story. I just had to sit there and really consider this. I mean, adoption is, is like the Occam's razor answer, but I like to think that the EMH like somehow sired a half hologram kiddo. Yeah, life uh, finds a way. <laughs> In the capsule, as it descends, Daniel Day Kim is like calling the customer service hotline of his planet and, you know, getting a lot of guff from whoever picks up the phone and like they won't, you know, put him on with their manager. Yeah. Launch control became the tactical command center 50 years ago. You're dead. It's really tough. I would have just given up at this point. My wife would have powered through. And, and like the stakes are getting raised because now the surface is shooting tri-cobalt devices at the Voyager. Yeah, it seems as though at some point their weapons technology surpasses Voyager's defense technology. Yeah. Their communications technology remains the same though. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> like Daniel Day Kim has been gone for not that long Voyager time, but a year and a half planet time. And mm -hmm. this is enough for the planet to launch a couple of ships they come up into orbit and like tractor onto Voyager from both sides and pull it into a higher orbit. 
and uh, warp drive is back. They're, the day is saved. They're going to be able to leave. And then Daniel Day Kim appears on the bridge, and it's like not clear if he beams over, or if it's like a hologram of him that's like being represented from one of the ships or something. Yeah. But he's like, hey, sorry it uh, took me a little bit longer than expected. It's been really, really amazing getting to know you guys. Feel like I'm saying goodbye to old friends. They're like, we don't feel like that. We just met you. There's coffee in first contact the proper way. Unfortunately, that won't be possible. He does that thing where he says, like, it feels like I'm saying goodbye to old friends. And then he just blurps away. Like, he does not say goodbye to old friends. He just says it feels that way. <laughs> he sucks at goodbyes, you know. Forgive him. I don't like this scene because, once again, you don't know anything about his inner life. Like, say something about, like, yeah, I'm a hero down there. I'm a very popular leader and president, given my experience. And yeah. like, I ushered my entire planet through whatever it was that just happened. And uh, I'm a hero. Good for me. Like, there's nothing about him. I have spent most of the past year touring the planet, like helping people prepare themselves for the emotional shock of the like one constant in our society going away. Like yeah. the skyship is leaving and that will change everything for our people. What I've done is placed a lot of high dollar value bets in just about <laughs> every gambling establishment I could find on the light in the sky disappearing. <laughs> so I'm about to be a very, very rich man. The uh, seismic retrofitting industry, I've placed a lot of shorts on uh, yeah. <laughs> companies that work in that space. It turns out Daniel Dickham's character is a total monster. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be a great Star Trek episode, though? Like, as it is, this is how the episode ends. Like, an old Daniel Day, Kim sits on a rock looking at the city below, and then he watches the Voyager disappear. But, like, I would argue that's a nice Star Trek ending but not an interesting science fiction ending. Right. And I feel like this episode of Star Trek Voyager is straining against that aspect, right? Like, are you a interesting science fiction pulp novel or are you a Star Trek episode? And it feels like this is one that just sort of dips its toe into the pulpy aspects of it, but stays super duper clean yeah. on the story as it goes. Well, how does that work for you, Adam? Did you like this episode? You know, I'm really easy to get along with most of the time. But I don't like bullying. I don't like friends. And I don't like you. I wish it was more pulpy. Yeah. I think it could be still super Star Trek-y in that way. Like, if the guy that was their savior that helped them get out of the space anomaly was somebody that they had morally ambivalent feelings about, like that doesn't make it non Star Trekky. If he took the access that he had had to the skyship and went back to his people, and they knew that he was like a totally avaricious character that used it for ill gotten gains in his society, that would be like an amazing Star Trek end. That they, yeah. this is like a classic example of why you don't violate the Prime Directive. This was a total fuck up by us, and we feel shitty about it. To avoid maybe the most obvious consequence of time travel being like greed and avarice, it just felt like the missing notes in a story. Yeah. Does that make this more interesting or less though? I don't know. Like, I think there are Miriam episodes of Star Trek where I've been like effusive in my praise of an episode like going in a new and interesting place. And just as many where I'm like, you know, that is a story we've experienced before, done really, really well. And in this case, I think it might just be down to the Daniel Day Kim effect. Like you see him on screen and you expect something more developed than what you get. And I think maybe yeah. that's what I'm straining against is like, look at him. You got a Daniel Day Kim here. Like that's all you're going to do with him? I think that's where I'm at. I think if it's yeah. any other actor, like a guest actor of the week that we don't know Maybe I don't feel that same way. Maybe I'm like, great episode, interesting guy. Wonder whatever happened to him. But I, I see Daniel Day Kim and I'm like, something amazing happened to him and they're not telling us. Yeah, yeah. I think that, um, you know, between the sort of pulled punch on his character 
seeming to be pretty underdeveloped and pretty, I mean, I, I get it. Like they only have a moment with the characters in each timeline that they show us on this planet. Mm -hmm. And he got the most by far. Yeah. But between that and the like never seeming to really give us stakes for the planet, you know, like I want, I, I wanted to see skyscrapers falling over. Mm -hmm. I wanted to feel like the earthquakes that Voyager was causing had real negative impacts and that like even when the doctor describes the war that breaks out that destroys his apartment it sounds like a meaningless border skirmish that like didn't have any geopolitical antecedents and it didn't have any geopolitical fallout when apartments are destroyed that is definitionally like civilian casualties yeah that had to be a major situation. Right. And he's like, yeah, some guy decided to like shoot us up. And so we like shot him back and then it was over. It's, it's like, uh, <laughs> wait a minute. Like, how about that is caused by a huge earthquake and like, you know, and, and people have really strong feelings about the skyship doing this to them. I just think that the script needed like one more draft or something. Turns out I came so close to death that I started coming real ropes. <laughs> now it's the only thing that can make me feel anything anymore. The only thing that can make me feel anything anymore, Adam, is priority one messages. Let's see how close to death we get <laughs> as we read the next messages, Ben. Priority one message from Starfleet coming in on secured channel. Need a supplemental income. Supplemental income? Supplemental. Supplemental yeah, it's extra. But the interest alone could be enough to buy this ship. Our first one here is from Kevin McCoy. It is to Uxbridge Shimoda Quality Assurance Team. Oh, no. Oh, no. I feel like we've been getting a lot of these lately. Yeah. Goes like this. I'm currently halfway through Voyager Season 4 and saw the last few seasons have had a noticeable boost in the quality and smoothness of editing with drops feeling like they're part of the flow. It was great before and even better now, thanks to everyone involved. Could whoever edits this please play the drop they think is the most underappreciated? Wow. Well, how do you expect me to type? Not with your fingers. With my nose? It would have definite advantages. Look, well, it's typing everything I'm saying. Not with your fingers. Oh, my nose. They'll destroy you. Do you see that? With my nose? There it sits. Stop it! Everything you have done, stop with your fingers. Stop with your fingers. Stop. Well, how do you expect me to type? With my nose? Stop. Stop it! Stop. Stop it! Stop. Stop it! Stop it. Oh, my nose! Stop it. You thought you could handle it. So handle it. That does it. I quit. Well, if you rearrange the, the letters Kevin McCoy you'll find that you can make the name Windy Pretty. <laughs> you think this is a pseudonym? <laughs> I too think the show's quality has been great, Kevin. You know who's to blame here. There's a picture of Kevin McCoy here uh, next to the note, and it's um, this person has very thick-rimmed glasses and a big nose and mustache and eyebrows. Uh-huh. But then, like... Kind of the same haircut as Wendy. Hmm. Hmm. Huh. All right. <laughs> Look, Kevin, you can, like, just attempt to get into her DMs or something. Don't <laughs> don't play this game with the P1s. Eh, I like, I like the money. I'd say go ahead and play the game. Ben, our second priority one message comes from Jeff from Cullowee, North Carolina. Messages to Ben and Adam, and it goes like this. I had a whole thing about how great this pod is, but I get fewer characters than I thought, so <laughs> right to the bit. Uh, yeah, I was wondering why we don't see any Gorns in the TNG era, a species of hideous intelligence who know only aggression and destruction. Where did they go? Could it be that a particular immortal race knew them as the Hus? Get a life. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the message gets cut off from there. Wow, that's good headcanon. Kevin Uxbridge solved the problem for everyone? 
Jeff's idea is that Kevin Uxbridge killed the Gorns. Wow. And and maybe to Kevin, the Gorns were the Hoosnock. Amazing. Yeah, actually, if you rearrange the letters in Hoosnock, it does spell Gorn. It does. Wow. And when we've seen depictions of the Hoosnock, it looks like a kind of a Godzilla head man. Yeah. But with like a big nose and like big rimmed glasses and a mustache and bushy eyebrows. I never really described the Hoosnock, did I? <laughs> I didn't want it to make it about what they look like. I thought that would make me look pretty bad. Worse than genocide. I didn't want to add insult to injury. <laughs> you know, I could go on and on about them. Not terribly talented singers either, but uh, far from the worst thing about them. I mean, how much do I have to disparage them when every single one of them is dead? <laughs> wow. Well... We've had some great Priority One fun today. And yeah. if you'd like to get in on the fun, head to MaximumFun.org slash Jumbotron and send a message up today. Hey, Ben. What's that, Adam? Did you find yourself a drunk Shimoda? Incredible. Drunk Shimoda. Oh, boy. I am going to give my drunk Shimoda to Chakotay. The uh, revelation that the probe is going to take several more hours to configure so that he can do his little study, that's another bet that works out well in the long run. Like, great guess by him. Yeah. But based on nothing, and the problem is fucking urgent. (laughs) Like, they got to get out of here. Deploy that probe. There is a real lack of urgency most of the time this episode. Yeah. Yeah. It's only when they're at the receiving end of a weapon that they really decide to, uh, like, affect some action, right? Bangers are the ultimate raise in stakes, I guess. Yeah, bangers are the ultimate equalizer in this case. (laughs) How about you? Did you have a drunk Shimoda? Yeah, I might just make it Janeway for a similar reason. Like... We've seen how flexible the Prime Directive can be in moments of crisis or emergency. I think you got to go to the planet. I mean, send the doctor back is what I'm saying. Like, how disappointed should she be in the doctor for not really doing much to actually study the planet and how it works in an effort to get them out of there? Like, he's got weather reports (laughs) and a couple of geological surveys. That's not going to help. No. Instead, he was down there fucking. Yeah. Fucking around. The doctor should be in big trouble. That's what I'm trying to say. That's why I'm switching my Shimoda to the doctor. (laughs) He fucked around and found out. Yeah. He found out very little. (laughs) Not enough to help them. So, yeah. I switched up my Shimoda during. Wow. And I landed on the doctor. I really respect that. Yeah. I found my way to the right Shimoda eventually. All right, you talked me into it. He's my Shimoda, too. (laughs) All right! (laughs) Boy, Adam, it's time for us to think about what we will be doing next week. That's the portion of the show that we've arrived at. Yeah. I'm going to uh, head over to gach.biz slash game, but let me first tell you about Season 6, Episode 13, Virtuoso. The Doctor's passion for music spills over into his personal life. Hmm. 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 Seems like they uh, maybe scanned the opera houses an episode too early. Yeah. It turns out this is just a retelling of what happened on this planet with the doctor. (laughs) I have uh, telemetry from our runabout on square 67, where uh, right ahead of us is that uh, Naomi Wildman square in which each host must make a piece of artwork that represents the episode and share it with the other and post pictures. That could happen to us. Ben, you may remember at the end of the last episode, I rolled a two and we went forward like a bunch of spaces that weren't two. I think any square on the board is a possibility at this point with what's going on here programmatically. We're in uncharted waters. Uh, Assuming the 
dice do work, though, we could also hit that Janeway square, which would take us up to a Neelix's galley. Oh, which yeah. Which is, of course, a bubble wine episode. Mm-hmm. You're required to learn as you play. Roll. I'm rolling. And I rolled a four, and we've actually gone forward four spaces. Chula! Did I win? Hardly. Huh. Skipped over Naomi Wildman. We are uh, right on the doorstep of that uh, Janeway Square on Square 71. And it's a regular old episode. That's great. That is great. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, going online and seeing friends of DeSoto talking about this episode. It's always really fun on show release day. Like, we're not really the people that load it up and press the go button anymore. So my experiences of Mondays and Fridays now is usually like some point in the middle of the morning going, oh, a, a new episode came out today. I should like see what's going on. And like, you don't subscribe to our own show anymore. I mean, it's in my podcatcher, but uh-huh. you know, I, I want the I want the download stats, but I don't sure. like, listen to it in there. Yeah. It's true. But it's it's always fun to like remember that I could go online and see people uh, joking around and talking about it. We really appreciate the folks who listen and especially the folks who support at maximumfun.org slash join. I also really appreciate the friends of DeSoto who take the time to review the show. I recently saw a review that did not like our show because all we ever did was drink and <laughs> hate the show we were watching. Wow. I don't know what podcast this person was listening to, but if you disagree with that assessment... Bury them! Drag them, kings and queens! A few more five-star reviews might go a long way toward negating whatever it was that axe was to be ground in our direction. Yeah. Weird. It's not for some people. Maybe this person ignored a warning bois and... uh, shouldn't have listened. The warning boys are all around us. We got to thank Wendy Pretty, the producer of this program. I love getting a, a thank you to Wendy Pretty in the P1s. That's nice. Absolutely. Yeah. She is deserving of all the thanks. Got to thank Bill Tilly, the card daddy, our social media coordinator. We got to thank Adam Ragusia, who made the original theme music of the show. And uh, Dark Materia, who made the original Picard song upon which it is based. Go find Adam Ragusi online, you, you goof. <laughs> Better than this. Quit goofing around. Yeah. Be serious. Come on. You think you're a serious person? Listen to the Adam Ragusi podcast. With that, we will be back at you next time. Another great episode of Star Trek Voyager. And an episode of The Greatest Generation Voyager. That's breaking into song. Oh, no. (laughs) Is the next episode a musical episode? I don't know. If it's the one I'm remembering, it kind of is. But I'm not sure. Oh, no. I'm going to need a drink for that one. (laughs) I am become bad Greatest Gen Review. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Destroyer of stars. Yeah, they really the secret at that, didn't they? Uh huh. Make it so. Maximum fun. A worker-owned network of artists' own shows. Supported directly by you.